from now on. Um, and we are going to, to share the recording afterwards with you as well. Uh, you are currently muted, but in case you want, you have any questions or you want to, to, to say something, you can rather or put the, uh, in the Q&A box any questions you have. We will be answering them at the end of the, uh, of, of the webinar. And also you can raise your hand so we can uh, give you a space. So the agenda for today, uh, we are going to give a very brief, brief, brief uh, overview of RAF USA and Organic Rower School. Um, we're going to talk about foundations of soil health, also about assessing challenges with soil health. Uh, we're going to talk about NRCS practices to address soil health. We are going to give a farmer perspective about soil health and also talk a little bit about your next steps. So about RAFI USA, we are a 30-year-old nonprofit. We're based in North Carolina. And our mission is to challenge the root causes of unjust food systems. We advocate for sustainable, equitable, just food systems. And we do it by uh, some programs. Uh, we, we work with challenging corporate power. Come to the table that it's a program that uh, puts together and connects com faith communities with farmers. Also expanding farmers access, market access. We have a program for farm advocacy and resources for resilient farms. Uh, we have another program of Just Foods, another one for policy and Farmers of Color Network. And for Farmers of Color Network uh, specifically, we support BIPOC farmers in the Southeast of the USA and the Caribbean. So it is um, Puerto Rico and US Virgin Islands. And we, uh, support these territories and these states, improving their economical viability, keeping their land, and gaining generational investments. The, that we do by the programs that are um, grants, some technical assistance, building collective power, and policy change. So now I'm going to pass uh, to, to Nicole. We are partnering together uh, in, in this webinar series. Please, Nicole. You can go now. Gracias a Rafi por invitarme a hablar contigo. Thanks to Rafi for allowing me to speak with you today. Um, can switch the slide. Organic Grower School, we are based in Western North Carolina, and we hope to inspire and educate and support people to farm, garden, and live organically can switch. We're, we're hoping to create a thriving food community. And one of the ways we do that is by serving farmers, in addition to home growers and other folks interested in sustainability. I primarily work with new and beginning farmers. You can switch the slide. And we offer a whole spectrum of classes and educational support for new and beginning farmers and for more established farmers. So we're excited to have Rafi participating in some of our craft farm tours this year and forest farming tours that are happening now and throughout the summer. We also offer some year-long farmer trainings, particularly Farm Beginnings, which is a cohort-based learning to really help beginning farmers um, understand how to start their business. You can switch the slide. And so we have a couple of info sessions coming up on Instagram Live. So if you want to come to our OGS page um, next or next Tuesday at lunch, and then we'll have one June 8th in the evening, and we'll have some graduates from some of our programs coming and speaking about um, what our farmer training has meant to them and their farm business. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I'm really excited that we're partnering more with Rafi this year. Gracias por todo. And my email is below. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. We're likewise um, excited about that partnership. We see Organic Grower School as just an incredible um, holder of um, farm and, and garden, cropland curriculum. 
um, supporting farmers both on the business and production side. And it's been a pleasure to do this series with you. So we hope everyone is here today for the resources for resilient farms webinar number two. This webinar is on soil conservation on cropland. Um, our last webinar was an introduction to the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service of the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture. If you have not yet seen that webinar, we will provide a link to that at the end of this presentation, as well as a link to this presentation. So to begin, um, I am wondering when I say healthy soil, what do you visualize when I say healthy soil? What does it look like? What does it feel like? How does it smell? What happens when it rains? What happens when it hasn't rained for a week or more? We're, we're here today because soil is the, the foundation of our crops. Um, many of you have um, varying experiences of um, what style of farm or how long you've been farming or how your interest in conserving natural resources um, has developed over time. Um, regardless though, we're all here because we're interested in soil health. We are gonna focus on soil specifically in a cropland setting. I know many of you have uh, forest land that you might actively timber or conserve for wildlife needs. You may have pasture and raising livestock. Um, we will have more presentations, I'd like to say, um, down the road, um, further along on these other farm uses like pasture land, grazing land, forest land. Um, but today we are focusing on soil and crop land. So soil is the foundation of, of our crops. Um, it holds nearly everything that our crops need. It's health and the health of other resources we find on our land, like water, air, energy, plants, animals, and humans. Those are all independent of one another. And, and we depend on the interactions between all of these resources in order for our farms to thrive. So when you think about RAFI's program, Resources for Resilient Farms, what new meaning does this now take on? The, the quality of our resources make our farms well and healthy, and we can bounce back more easily in adversity. So Resources for Resilient Farms um, is, is here to help everyone conserve resources on your farmland, but we're also interested in other resources like knowledge, infrastructure, technical and financial assistance. This program exists not only to share information about natural resources, but also make sure um, that farms are thriving in other ways and that conservation is accessible, um, especially to new and beginning farmers, farmers of color, veterans, women, and those with limited incomes. So um, on this slide, we're, we're gonna see briefly um, the primary functions that soil should, should serve in anywhere, uh, but especially on our farms. Um, you're gonna see um, the functions of soil appear one by one. And we want to ask ourselves, does our soil on our land serve these functions well? So um, this, th these functions like regulating water, how water moves through the soil and, and how it reaches the water table underneath our topsoil and soil horizon or the soil column. Um, soil should sustain plants and animal life both. It should be the nutrient that is actually producing high quality vegetation um, for wildlife, for our livestock, um, high quality crops for us to market or sell or give away. Um, go ahead and click. Um, 
Soil should serve as a filter and a buffer against pollutants. There's a lot of research behind the, the function of soil um, and certain plants present in that soil to actually filter pollutants, um, improving soil quality over time. Soil should cycle nutrients. And soil finally should provide physical stability and support, not just for our crops, but for our farm buildings and our other human needs on, on land. Um, there's there's a um, agreement among soil scientists, soil experts, extension specialists, and conservation planners that soil needs to serve these functions. And it needs to serve these functions very well um, to be considered healthy soil. And soil science or expert professionals will help evaluate the quality of soil and how well it is serving these functions on your land. Um, why we're here today is that all farmers and forest landowners can access a tax paid resource, a professional to assess your soil health and help you improve your soil health and help you afford these improvements. This resource we're learning more about today is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we have um, a, an expert in conservation planning with us today, um, who's gonna help us understand how we can improve the health of soil, um, specifically on cropland, um, but what a lot of what you learn today might also be transferable to other land types, such as that grazing or pasture land, range land, um, forested areas, and other kind of farmstead areas or where you might have buildings surrounding your farm. Our ultimate goal is that you walk away today learning how to actually make the improvements for soil health on your cropland. So not just understanding the challenges associated with maintaining healthy soil and the functions of healthy soil, but then what can you do to actually manage your soil health well? And NRCS has um, four principles of soil health. Um, and by actively practicing all four of these principles, you would be conserving and managing your soil well. Um, so these four are to minimize disturbance. So that would be um, uh, crossing your cropland, um, tilling or reduce tilling as little as possible, um, to maximize biodiversity, um, having you know, multi-species, multi-cropping, all serving different biological functions in that space. The third is to maximize soil cover. Um, this is where um, you, you may already know about um, cover crops, conservation cover, making sure that um, different kinds of mulch are covering the surface of the soil to reduce erosion, um, to retain water. And the last is to maximize living roots. So I'm excited to turn it over to Deanna Irzari to share in depth about how NRCS assesses soil health on cropland settings and how you might manage the soil health on your cropland with NRCS assistance. And our goal is to help you um, learn a little bit more of the technical language that NRCS uses so that when you take the next steps to speak with NRCS, you're, you're speaking in their terms, things sound somewhat familiar, and then we will um, guide you kind of step by step through the process of getting um, that one on one assistance from NRCS. So, Deanna, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, so I don't use Zoom often, so you have to tell me which screen you're watching. We are seeing Did you see my presentation. Screen. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Jamie and Carolina, for inviting me. Um, I'm Diana Rosari. I'm the state outreach coordinator uh, for North Carolina, and I've been with NRCS for now 16 years. Um, my career has been in the field office, implementing soil health um, on farmland. 
Um, I work in North Dakota, Michigan, and Puerto Rico too. So um, I have some extent, uh, experience on, on soil health and conservation and in, in, in any type of land use. So today I'm just gonna talk about NRCS and the soil health solution or how we, we look um, soil health um, in the field office. Cause when you go as a participant, as a client, um, you have to go to the local field offices. So, and this is in the nationwide. I know there's some people that are from outside of North Carolina, from other state, um, maybe Puerto Rico, Florida. Um, but this is the same concept um, all over um, the nation. Um, NRCS or the Natural Resources Conservation Service is part of the US Department of Agriculture and principal agency for providing conservation technical assistance to farmers, ranchers, and landowners of non-industrial forest land to conserve the nation's soil, water, air, and other natural resources. Every time that I say this statement, I have to read it again multiple times to find out what really NRCS does, right? So this translates to soil conservationists, district conservationists, professional to be agronomists with NRCS, rangeland specialists, they go out and assist farmers um, and assess their land. Um, Sometimes we got people coming to our office that they want to plant cover crop and we need to find out why they want to plant cover crop. So that's the reason we are here. We just go out in the field, assess the land. We try to identify resource concerns. Um, and then we will talk to the farmer, hey, um, these are your resource concerns. What is the problem with your land? Um, do you have a lot of compaction or there's the reason why you have compactions? So um, this NRCS program, technical program and financial assistance are voluntary. And we offer science-based solution that benefit both the landowner and the environment. So I wanna to talk to you about how field offices assess soil health and problem. And we hear this a lot, you know, we go to conferences and we hear about soil health and the soil health principle. But when you go to the field office, um, we assess soil health differently. Um, or, you know, like how we see it, how, how we assess soil health. We first will start with a management his, um, history. We wanna know the tiller system. Uh, we want to know how you, if you do any fall or spring tillage, how you go with um, um, reducing tillage, right? So we want to know, we want to know exactly your whole system to plant from termination your, or from harvesting. We want to know your the whole tillage system. Um, we want to know about your crop rotation. And when you think about crop rotation, don't think about what crops do I grow on the land. You need to think about what crops you're growing on a piece of land. 100 feet by 50, how many crops you grow there? How many crops you recurring cropping on the same land? So I know we talk about on a, on a vegetable, it's, a, it's more challenging, but in, in an aspect I have people coming to my office say, yes, I plant corn, soybean, wheat. Okay, corn and soybean, wheat. But what is your really crop rotation? Oh, it's like two years of soybean, one year of corn, and then three years of soybean. That's what we wanna know. That's your crop rotation. And not only what crop do you grow, but the sequence of that crop. Um, we wanna know if you include cover crops in your rotation. Um, do you have irrigation? So those are the things that we have to document before you, we start with the assessment. Also, we like to, because we're the government, we like to document everything. So we have, we have to run the soil prediction tool to determine what is your benchmark. Okay, you wanna reduce soil. We, want, we need to quantify how much soil you're losing in an acre. Um, so we have to run a, a soil prediction tool to tell us that. And, we prove that you know there's the benchmark, and this is the plant um, um, system, which is reducing. Hopefully, it's reducing 
um, soil off um, on your land. And then after we finish with that interview with the, the farmer, we go and use the in-field soil health assessment worksheet. And you have access to this if you, you can Google search this worksheet, but this is what we're gonna take to the field after interviewing the farmer. And there's different um, indicators that we have here to tell us, yeah, there's, there's something going on with your field because we are addressing this resource concern that you have on the left, um, top left corner. We're gonna know, we wanna know if you have a problem with compaction, um, soil organic matter depletion, aggregate instability, soil organic habitat loss, those are the four resource concerns or the problem that we want to identify when we do soil health assessment. So those are, like I mentioned, those are the four resource concerns that we want to assess. And I include soil erosion in this uh, presentation too. Um, the first one I want to talk is compaction. Compaction, as you all know, it, it, it prevents air and water going through the soils, it prevents um, plant growth. It's, there's a lot that um, having compaction can, can impact your farm. You know, there's the, um, you know, soil biologists also get impacted with this um, um, resource concern on this problem. Uh, so how we assess compaction? Well, we have this um, tool that help us um, identify that there's compaction there. Also, you can get a wire, fla uh, wire flag and you can poke that soil and see if there's any, any resistance within the 12 inches. Um, so you don't need to get this fancy tool. And also you can dig your soil and you can check if there's any soil paddy on the surface. Um, um, and then there's other indicators like this one plant roots you can see how that compaction is impacting the the growth of that um, root and also ponding you know if you have ponding that that means that you have infiltration issues um, water runoff um, and, and those are indicators of poor soil health Organic matter depletion, uh, we're gonna check the soil cover. Um, if you have 90% soil covered, if you have 10% soil cover, you know, we have to determine that because that soil cover is very important for soil health, like, you know, the principle of maintaining soil cover. Uh, residue breakdown, we wanna know the activities of the soil biologists, um, on that, on that soil because it's all in a symbiotic um, system, right? And also I like to assess soil erosion. Aggregate instability. Um, this is a fun test that I like to do. Um, the slick test, you can take um, a soil sample, let it dry for a week, and then you dump it in the water wait a few seconds and see if it if it retain the structure or if it's I call it explosive like structure that means that they're weak aggregate uh, on that soil and the aggregate is what helps the soil to keep together you know like this is a, a relationship with how we biologists uh, soil biologists and your root system so this all work together to keep that soil so again this is an indicator of aggregate instability, but also it could be a indicator for compaction or, or, you know. So the indicators that we, we assessed include more than, than one resource concern. So aggregate stability helps with water infiltration, air exchange, plant root growth, and soil organism habitat. This is a good experiment, the slake test. This was like a month ago. The soil health specialist demonstrated this on the on one of the farm and the ladies there are loving it. They're gonna see the difference of uh, a no-till system which you can see the water is very clear 
that soil aggregate is hold together um, versus the one that is a conventional tillage that is breaking down those soil aggregates and there's not much glue on that soil to, you know, to hold together. And once you start losing soil, you're losing nutrients, you're losing organic matter. This is a water quality issue. So um, this is a good experiment. You can do it at your farm. Um, and then this, the other one that I, the other indicator is the surface crust that lead, lead to runoff erosion and crop damage. Um, if you see that on your farm, again, infiltration issues. Uh, ponding again is an in a, is a indicator for aggregate instability. And the same thing with the structure when you see the root, the J rooted. Um, organic matter depletion, I like this one because um, you can visualize it. You can take a sample of the field and go and, and make sure that you take the same soil type on a place that is undisturbed. Um, and you compare the color. If you have a lighter color on your sample versus the one that you took from undisturbed area, that means that you potentially have a, a, a low organic matter. Um, and my, one of my favorite is the soil organism habitat. I love to see this in the field. Like if I see the earthworms, you can see, you know, all of this microorganism or the everything you can see here. Um, you just count them, you're right? Like, and they tell you the, the assessment, how many organisms you, you see, like one or two. And sometimes I start digging and, oh, I saw an earthworm or, or ant or, you know, spider or whatever it is in the soil, like, what box is there? And then my time will go on and on because I want to keep watching what's going on. Um, so those are, and biopores is, is very important again to let the air and the water um, infiltrate and go through the soil. So we all need those animals. So we need to feed the soil so the soil can feed us, right? So um, we want to make sure that we have a good um, organism habitat. Again, I'm gonna go back to this slide. Those are the indicators. And um, this is what we assess. And then at the end, when we collect this data, it's gonna tell us if you have a resource concern on your land. Did you have or not have a resource concern on your land? So, and this is a good opportunity for the field office to, to um, NRCS field office to go and visit with the farmers and take this and do the test with them. So I just gonna go through very quick some of the practices that you can do to improve soil health. One is cover crop. Cover crop has so many functions, but I'm gonna tie them to soil health. Reduce compaction. You know, you got here the daikon radish, bigger than my pen there. So that helps with compaction, increase organic matter, um, soil biology, and prevent soil erosion. Uh, reduce tillage. You can do no-till system. You can do a, a reduced tillage system. Um, I know sometimes we till the ground ones, like the one on the right. That's a, a one-acre farm that I visited, and they till one, and they decided to not till anymore. So they reduce tillage and they, what they call it a hole punch planting. And that's how it looks so, so straight like that. Um, conservation crop rotation, again, diversify your crop. This example, the landowner decided to break that soybean after soybean after soybean. And they decided to do the um, wheat and then the following two years after that, they decided to incorporate crimson clover with cedar rye and um, treat kale. Nutrient management is very important. It helps you with the physical and the chemical biology of properties of the soil and also improve water quality. Pest management, uh, conservation system, reduce plant pressure, of course, 
reduce the risk of, to water quality and reduce the injury to beneficial organism, you know, like pollinator and some microorganism too, like soil organism too. Mulching and critical area planting, I will assist with also with um, soil erosion. And this is an example of the farm that I was talking about, the reduced tillage, they incorporated erosion control blanking on this soil erosion. And they use uh, fescue grasses, but you can be, you can use um, any grasses or anything that help with wildlife habitat or pollinator. You can do filter strip, you can do field borders. Those are some of the conservation practices that um, can be used on your farm, but it's good to have NRCS to assess the farm and give you options. And that's what we do. And this is your typical grass waterway. It looks like the other one that I just showed you, but um, it's just a, it's a bigger scale and it's engineered. Um, other practices, I'll say alley cropping. I haven't worked with alley cropping before, but um, the, um, but this is a, a practice that you can plan between um, rows of trees. So you have an alley for your crop between trees. Um, and there's some other practices that other states offer that we don't offer in North Carolina. So that's good that if you can visit your local field office to find out more about it. And the, after we assess this, the most important part is the conservation plan. We talk to you about the findings and then you make a decision what you wanna do. Um, and you don't have to do it all in once. You can do baby steps. You can do one field, one acre if you want, but this is your, this is your plan. And you don't need to feel overwhelmed because we're gonna be here, especially this conservation plan that I put this Joe farmer and it's very uh, loyal to NRCS. He lives in a 1000 NRCS drive, Riley. So um, I have to change this name from, from this conservation plan. Um, but this is just an example of how it looks like. And I have conservation plan for 0.5 acre, 0.1 acre. You know, there's no limit and there's no minute. And with that, we give you an implementation requirement. And you can, um, if you decided to implement those practices, we'll tell you how to do it. We have two major conservation programs, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and the Conservation Stewardship Program. The EQIP, it helps you to address that problem with the conservation practices. CSB, you already addressed that problem. You're a pro in conservation and we wanna pay you for that. Um, EQIP is usually like one year, minimum one year contract or two year contract, depending on the state and then CSP is a five-year contract. We will reimburse you after you complete that conservation practices for both of them, and you have to follow that implementation requirement. Equal will pay you one time, and sometimes depending on the conservation practices, you can have it multiple years, but one time a year. CSP will pay you once a year for five years. So those are the two major ones major financial assistance and some expectation that I put here like there's a rule that you need to implement a conservation practice within 12 months of the contract I highly recommend keep copies of receipts save your seed tags follow their seeding rates especially the pure live seed keep records if you do like nutrient management and pest management and make sure that you understand the payment rates, contracted amount versus implemented amount. And again, my name is Diana Rizari. I'm the state outreach coordinator. And if you're in North Carolina, please visit me. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'm one of Diana's biggest fans um, and in her new role, in outreach, um, she really does want to be a resource to everyone across the state. And I know we have a lot of people joining from outside of North Carolina and Deanna wanted to design a presentation that could relate to everyone. Um, so this is information that would equip you to uh, equip, 
um, to take these next steps um, with NRCS if you feel it's the um, best resource for your farm and if especially the financial assistance feels like it would be right for you um, this coming year or in years following. I wanna um, now um, shift us to our Q&A portion with Mr. Patrick Brown of Brown Family Farms. Um, um, we'll start with an introduction. So uh, Rick, would you wanna just briefly introduce yourself to the group and, and we'll um, go through the question and answers that I first have for you, and then we'll open up the general Q&A for everyone else in the webinar. See, Rick was there. He might be having a little bit of technical difficulty. Yes, actually, he he's not in the call, but I'll, I'll be emailing him. Uh, we have a, a question in the Q and A. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Here is Rick. Hey, Rick. No worries. Sorry, I had technical difficulties. <laughs> It's a day of it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, uh, Carolina just mentioned that there's a question in the Q&A that might be specifically for um, Deanna. So Carolina, would you ask that question? Yes, of course. So the question is, can NRCS designation allow farm business development on same land if so, are there any restrictions on activities on NRCS designed land? So maybe for Diana. Okay. So what is the restriction? Say the question again. Is there any restriction? Yes. So it, it says. Can NRCS designation allow farm business development on same land? If so, are there any restrictions on activities on NRCS designated land? Maybe that means, and um, it's from Leonardo Wasili. Um, apologize if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Carolina, you could unmute Leonardo. Um, to clarify, but it, it sounds like this more more if there's a if there's contract, contract active on um, land, can you further farm development? Yes, Leonardo. So, yes, if you want to talk, you just can't unmute yourself. Hello. Um, yeah, I was just. Um, had a question if if we did had it designated can um does that restrict development or um uh, you know so for example I, I think i have about 13 acres here and if i designated you know i could designate different pieces of of land and then rotate them is that what i hear i, I guess that's sort of more specific to the question I had. Yeah, you can you can rotate that. I mean, um, but you mentioned about development, um, which, you know, if you get into a contract, then we have to review, we have to remove that portion of, from the contract. But other than that, you know, if it's cropland, you can keep it as a cropland. And if you decided to develop then we just remove it from the contract. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, th I think so. It's it it has to do with like yeah if if I turned it into farmland or kept it as forest land right now. Right, and and you know this if it, if if forest land instead of, we will designate it forest land but maybe the taxpayer will you know like taxes will be different there's something related with the taxes so i'm not you know 
but yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So um, we'll give um, it over to Patrick Brown now, owner and operator of Brown Family Farms near Norlina, North Carolina. Um, for those of you not in North Carolina, um, this would be the um, kind of northeastern region of the state. Um, very sandy, loose soils, uh, rolling hills. Um, Rick, could you share a little bit um, just broadly about you and your farm, and then we'll start our um, interview together? I was mute. Sorry about that. Thanks for having me today. Um, I am the fourth generation farmer on the estate at Brown Family Farms. My name is Rick Brown, and I have been farming since my dad retired in 1998. Um, we grow vegetables, uh, especially crops and non-GMO conventional soybean. So a little bit of everything. Um, I got to um, be out at Rick's farm last weekend and, and really got to see the wide array of, of what you're practicing and what you're growing and in different land areas. Um, and you said that you're a regenerative farmer. So I'm wondering what do you grow and how do you define regenerative at your farm? Yeah, so we, we grow regenerative uh, agriculture uh, uh, programs um, that we incorporated to try to focus on carbon sequestration. One of those crops that we grow are industrial hemp fiber as a specialty crop, um, naturally grown produce, and as mentioned, non-GMO conventional soybean. How regenerative ag is defined on our farm is low tillage to no tillage on some acres in a rotational row crop cycle and high tunnel vegetable production. So those are those three kind of different settings that I saw. Um, yeah, high tunnel, you have vegetable crops in field, um, and then you have, you know, further kind of from the farm was like the commodity industrial hemp, right? Correct. Um, so you mentioned your fourth generation, you've had, owners, operators before you, um, and there's a rich history on the land. Um, particularly, you, you talked about your dad and uh, his effort in conservation, and he seemed very motivated to conserve soil and water on the farm. Um, what did this conservation look like at that time? Um, and what resources were critical for him to conserve soil and water? Yes. Uh, well, my father motivated me while farming the land when he farmed with less. Uh, he went from one row operation to a four row operation when he retired in 1998. From sunup to sundown most days to scouting fields with him on Saturdays while riding on the back of his pickup truck, pickup truck checking rain meters and fields and topping tops of tobacco when he saw that they had bloomed. Uh, those were the good old days. Uh, tobacco was our cash crop. It, it was what clothed us and fed us. Um, during that time, my father farmed the land. He participated in many soil and water conservation programs to conserve soil by preventing erosion on uh, what we still have today as uh, considered highly erodible land. And that's this image that everyone can see. Um, the whole farm, um, plus you said, I think you said leased land. Could you describe a little bit about what people are seeing in this aerial map and, um, and how you would define highly erodible land where you are? Correct. So this particular track, which is 919, is our actual farmland that we own. We do not lease these areas. Uh, the cropland, as you can see, are fields 4, 14, 5, 6, 12, 8, and 9. So what separates, um, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, uh, for example, we'll look at field number 9, which is about 18.1 acres. 
if you can kind of zoom in, I don't know if we can, but each area of field number nine has been incorporated with waterways and easements so that the uh, the purpose of this is so that the land topsoil will be retained and, and so that it won't run off. Um, as at that time, uh, my father mostly tilled uh, during that time frame. So if, of course, if you continue to till and continue to till each and every season, you're going to lose a vital portion of your topsoil, which is the most important soil that's needed to grow productive crops. So by applying for a EQIP program through the North, through the NRCS, uh, we were able to put inputs of waterways to prevent this from happening so that the that the fields when they rain or when or if they're irrigated can be properly drained. Okay. And so you wanted to see proper drainage. You wanted to see reduced erosion. Um, do you feel like you've achieved some of these results since implementing? Yes. So what we did as the fourth generation is added to that process. Uh, my dad mostly focused on rotation to help with um adding microorganisms or, uh, to the land, to the soil. What we're doing is we implement cover crops that focuses more on organic matter and helps to retain the topsoil as well by also using the things that are already there, such as the waterways. Okay. So we might be able to see evidence of the waterways in the images, kind of the lighter brown between the darker green swaths. Um, these would be areas that instead of um, getting uh, plowed or tilled up with other site preparation for transplanting or seeding, they remain grassed and it's retaining water and slowing down water. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about the other area where you're farming, which I don't know if folks would be able to see this, this small on the map, but you have a high tunnel um, and you have a caterpillar tunnel on the farm. Um, could you share a little bit about that structure? And is it the structure itself that conserves soil inside of it? Or is it your soil management practices inside the tunnel that are conserving your soil? So it's the practice of soil management that factors the most beneficial aspect of the soil. For example, minimum soil disturbance, rotation, proper inputs, companion planting by maximizing biodiversity and irrigation are all common factors in building the microbial organic matter and managing good and healthy soil in our high tunnel. Uh, so we do not disturb the soil by tillage in our high tunnels and we allow our high tunnels to produce quality produce year round. And the high tunnels have become a wildly popular um, NRCS practice that is cost shared. And this can be a significant um, lift for a, a farmer trying to do companion planting, small scale production and have the protection that that high tunnel offers um, overhead. Um, but sometimes I do think what's missed is like the, these practices applied inside um, applying soil amendments, mulching, minimum or no, t no tillage. Um, um, are any of your management practices conserving or improving other resources besides soil? We named some earlier in the presentation, like water, plants, animals, such as wildlife. Yes, our farm metal strips are conserved for animal wildlife to feed. We do not harvest our fescue metal strips for hay for the sole purpose of creating a safe and nourishable area for wildlife habitat. We also allow our fall cover crops to areas to grow throughout the winter for animal nourishment to feed. Our surface water is tested each year for bacteria. We also conserve our natural springs that are on the farm by keeping them steady flowing and by applying for cost share programs through the NRCS to maintain soot and sediment ponds that are on our property. Okay, so maybe tying that to what Deanna explained earlier that um, the, the practices you might apply in your land are actually serving multiple purposes 
Um, and, and today you've named several that most relate to soil conservation, but they do have this kind of fuller ecosystem benefit. Um, that, that's great. I didn't actually know about the, the strips that um, you're keeping for wildlife forage. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's in the hopper? What's kind of your next project related to conservation or otherwise? Great question. Our next project is to focus on natural energy, such as the implementation of adding solar technology to our farm, creating ways to document data for greenhouse gas retainment and exposure, and creating a baseline data for carbon sequestration opportunities and sharing that data with our farm service agency as we report our crops annually. Wow, that's awesome. I know you always have a lot, a lot going on. Um, thank you, Rick. Um, I wanna direct people um, at the bottom of your screen there is a icon uh, with kind of two chat bubbles. Um, that's the Q&A, and that's where you can ask a question for um, Nicole from Organic Grower School, Rafi uh, for Rick Brown, or for um, Deanna. Um, and we will read your question out loud and they'll have a chance to answer. Um, Caroline, if you advance to the next slide, uh, we do want to, um, and initiate kind of the the next steps um, that anybody uh, could take um, after this webinar. Um, it's a great time of year to begin considering what kind of conservation activities you want to prioritize on your farm and what you might actually need financial assistance for. Um, and RCS does have an annual cutoff in which you should apply to be considered for the following fiscal years funding assistance. Um, anybody can apply any time in the year, but this is a particularly great time to begin preparing, to start having the discussion with NRCS of what you might wanna do and how they could financially support those efforts. Um, so your most immediate next steps could be to identify your NRCS contact. Um, we will share these slides and this link at the um, uh, close of the presentation. So um, there's a locator tool where you can look up your location anywhere in the US or territories and find your soil conservationist or a district conservationist, that would be a supervisor's contact. In addition, Rafi provides free technical assistance that is individualized per farmer. Um, so if you, um, you know, for understandable reasons, don't yet want to contact NRCS, um, you can contact Rafi and we can assist you through that process. Um, we can help you identify some of your resource concerns and maybe some of the practices um, like those mentioned today that you may be interested in applying. And you can see um, on the next slide, um, NRCS's steps to assistance and where we come in is before step one. Um, you can begin, um, if, if you have a smartphone, you can scan um, the conservation assessment QR code here on the screen. Um, this assessment will go directly to Carolina and I, and we would follow up with you. Um, it'll help us better understand um, your efforts to date to conserve resources. We want to assume that everyone here has made you know, some effort to protect the land you're on because it's deeply important to you, your family, generations before and generations to come. Um, and your input's gonna help us provide really tailored information like what we have today um, to a wider audience. And it would also begin this process for free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with NRCS. And um, we'll leave our contact information here on the screen while we open it up for question and answers. Um, from Carl, we have one question. Um, are you working with extension programs to help with gathering data and utilization of resources to collect useful data for funding, et cetera? How is your data protected to ensure you can utilize data for your own producer needs? I think that might be for Rick. 
Yes, Carl, thank you so much for your question. We work with uh, two uh, organ organizations outside of our, our NRCS and extension office to um, analyze the data. Those two companies are Heartland Hemp for Soil and Pure Strategies. They take our data information each and every season uh, as we uh, go throughout different crops that we grow. And they're also able to share that information with our local extension agent when on the federal side, those opportunities come to come into place. Currently right now, we don't show any um, programs that are accepting the carbon credit data for uh, monetary, um, monetary funds to go towards input costs for the following season. We hope that our federal uh, legislators and our federal offices um, allow us to pro provide that data to our farm service agency um, to be able to eventually get that program, get those programs started. Thanks, great specific question. Mm -hmm. You can also um, select the raise your hand button. Yes, so uh, we also have questions in the registration form. We have several good questions, so uh, we hope to be here like until 15 minutes more if you can stay with us. And in that time, um, there are some good questions here. For example, uh, will someone come to your farm and make an assessment? So these, uh, I think, would be directed to Diana. If you could please help us with this one. Will someone come to your farm and, and make an assessment? So I understand it is an assessment on soil. Yes, yes, we'll do. And this, you can come and visit us at the office, but ultimately we need to go and assess the farm. You know, we can walk the farm with you. We can have a, just a regular conversation about your goals and objectives, because ultimately, uh, we want to make sure that what we identified and what we um, recommend is what you want to do. Um, so we do have to go out on the farm and assess the field. Um, and just to say in, in general, uh, we cover cropland, pasture land, forest land, um, headquarters. I mean, we covered everything. Great, and a, a follow-up question to that, Deanna. Um, maybe before those soil assessments happen, what does an initial farm visit look like? Um, ideally, in your opinion, what does it look like? Um, and then what sometimes happens during that first farm visit that might help our audience kind of understand what that experience might be like? Yeah, so the first visit, you know, most of the time I do have the, you know, like an email and a phone call and we'll schedule that. Sometimes we, they come to the office before I go there. Um, but I just have like something to follow, like what is your crop rotation? What is your concern? And sometimes they can point out what, what are their concerns, like soil erosion. Um, and that way I can record that information and everything is documented. Well, every time we visit your farm, we have to document on a, con we call it consex notes, um, make sure that you're being served correctly, and then you have all the information you need it. Sometimes the information is so overwhelmed that we have to do a second visit, or sometimes we can write down the information and, and have it for you on the second visit. So it, sometimes it takes more than one visit to, to gather all the information and feel comfortable too, because what I learned in, you know, all these years, it's hard to um, say it all in, in 20 minutes or an hour of a visit. So. Great. Uh, there are some more technical questions. One is, how can I have value added or added value with our chicken's poop? If so. um, right. So what I, in my experience with um, you can rotate those chickens on your farm and you incorporate uh, the animal aspect of soil health that we did not discuss here because it's cropland. But that's something that you can use and rotate that and, 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 
can be like a ecosystem with with the animal and and the cropland. Great, thank you so much. And um, how to control weeds such as nut sage? Nut sage, I don't know that weed, but cover crop. I I recommend rock. We have a lot of pigweed on on our fields here in North Carolina. It's very aggressive weed. And what I seen some farmer is go heavy on to be just single species of um, zero right or, or wheat. Um, you usually start with recommend like 55 pounds to 75 pounds, that range. But if you go heavy on, on a heavy, heavy rate, um, seeding rates on zero right, I see a lot of improvement. And I wanted to show that in one of my slides but I was like I was putting too much pictures but I seen a lot of a benefit of doing the heavy zero ride and then plant your cover crop after that um, after that um you know on, on a green green cover crop great and um also Jamie it said here it's not such maybe um so then i suggest a heavy seeding of cereal rye and planting into the cover crop after that but mm -hmm. it's a very good it could be mm -hmm. and you can do a mix of um crimson clover you can go heavy on, on your on your diversity because you can target other you know wheat suppression and then you can target the the compaction and other and other resource concerns Perfect. There is another one. Do resource conservation include irrigation and hoop houses? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And those are irrigation are engineer practices. So we will have an engineer to assess those for us. And, and this agency is very big. We have engineers, we, saw, we have soil scientists, soil health experts, um, agronomists, grazing specialists. So if we can um, get an answer or give you an answer, we sure will find the specialist that can help us. Great. And now we start with uh, questions in Spanish. So I'm going to read them out loud in Spanish, try to translate them as well in English. So there is an interesting question here. Cuando una finca tiene unos fondos asignados, ¿qué tiempo tiene para utilizarlos? So when a farm has assignated funds, how much time do you have to utilize those funds? Um, Spanish and English can I answer. Uh, you can do it in English, please. And then our translators will. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, so when you get a contract with NRCS, either EQIP or CSP, those, that money is tied to that contract. So when I said on the slides about payment rates, those payment rates and that payment will be available after you implement the practice according to the NRCS standards and specs and specification. So that contract you have is, 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 is a term and condition. There's, you know, like with you and NRCS, and once you implement that contract, you or that practice, you get paid after that. And we're nationwide here, so every every state has their own rules. So how long it will take from the time you implement it and the time that you get paid. Um, so I'm not I'm not gonna put dates there because it varies between state and state. Um, but you know how busy the office is, but we try to get those. Those are priorities for us, implementation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diana. Um, there is another question. So I actually don't know that the, the word in, in English, but in Spanish it is. Um, ¿Cuáles son algunas plantas rastreras para mejorar el suelo en cafetales? This maybe like from a farmer in Puerto Rico, we don't have <laughs> much uh, coffee here in, in mainland, but if any one of you has any any ideas, the question in English would be um, <clears throat> like which uh, 
uh, which plants do you use like as a mulch to cover like the, uh, the, um, like, the a small, like a small like a small not a a tall crop like zero yeah. right and and I grew up on a coffee farm <laughs> in Puerto yes, Rico exactly. so uh -huh. I yeah. always thought about that and you know I'm a agronomist and all that but I cannot convince my dad to do <laughs> this thing <laughs> but um but I will recommend you contact as I know this the there's an agronomist there in this in the in Puerto Rico and if you give me the con your content information I will try to coordinate that with the local in my mind I was just thinking about clover and but I don't want to recommend something that it could be invasive for Puerto Rico like the the mani is the the, the manis uh, forraje um, there's some uh, a clover variety I will say in the island but I will probably reach out to them and, and see what the cover crop is for, for Puerto Rico. So what I recommend is not an invasive for, for the island. Thank you, Diana. And the last question we have here um, is about a, a, if, if a farmer is not a bona fide farmer, that is in the case of Puerto Rico, if they can apply they can apply if they have an FSA number. So just, yes. I think the FSA number, and I wish I had FSA here, but some of the, their policy has changed. Now they're given farm and track number on a building because building, um, we have um, producers that are growing microgreens on building. So, and there's no minimum, I believe. So you may want to check um, because I have contract for 0.1 acre. Um, so um, you may want to check on, on, on what are the rules in Puerto Rico, if that's the, the case. But here recently, uh, those rules about, I don't know what was the rule, right? But, you know, it's more flexible um, because of the urban farming too. Okay, so thank you so, so much. These were the questions that, that we had. Thank you so much for the participants. And before you go, there is a, a very important um, thing that we would like you, we would like to ask you to do. So please evaluate our webinar. It takes just a few seconds, but it will help us to continue design. Uh, uh, like, better webinars and spaces where we can all participate. Um, Jamie, do you wanna? Uh, um, appreciate Diana and, and Rick for your time presenting. Um, I, I think what we would like to do um, is in our series next, go through kind of land use by land use. So we will have a presentation uh, related to uh, resource conservation on livestock or grazing land. Um, sometimes the resources um, in, in these settings could be soil, water, plants, or animals. Um, so we will have more in this series to come. And we'd also like to um, get events happening in person so that we can see some of these active practices on farms. Um, with NRCS and the farmer both present um, where, and we have kind of this live conversation again um, to see both um, the, the real work at hand and also kind of understand what ideally we would be seeing over time after conservation practices are implemented. Um, so if you've um, completed the poll, thank you. And um, you can be in touch with Carolina or I, excuse me. Um, and then we um, would love to follow up with you about making those next steps with NRCS. Thank you so much. And if we still have like one minute, there it, uh, a question just came up like uh, from Leonardo. Can we get seeds for wildflowers too? I don't know if Diana is. Like seed for wildflowers? Yes. Yes, uh, I, we in North Carolina work with a local wildlife biologist that help us 
to determine what type of um, seeding rates and what type of uh, species should be planted. And we'll follow their, rec their recommendation because they're the specialists. So we have that um, partnership with them and the local um, our state biologists too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Muchas, muchas gracias. And thank you so much for answering as well the, the evaluation that helps us a lot. Thank you for to our panelists and be, be attentive to our, our next webinars we are going to be launching.